Well, good evening. Let's commence some singing together of some hymns and choruses. Just in case you want to sing and you can't see if you left your glasses this morning, would you please come and get them either now or at the end? That's now a watch, glasses, a bracelet. Well, there's so many things there. If nobody lifts them in the next three or four weeks, I'm going to have a jumbo sale on the Tuesday. And if it's yours, you can come and join us and you can get it. Fairest of all the earth beside, chiefest of all unto thy pride, fullness divine in thee I see, wonderful man of Calvary. Let's sing it out. It was down at the feet of Jesus on the happy, happy day that my soul found peace in believing and my sins were washed away. Where I brought my guilt and sin, 
beneath the cross of Jesus. What a lovely, lovely piece this is. I fain will take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. different words to a different tune. So we'll move on to the next one, Ivan. Is that okay? Let's move on to what kind of love is this? It's bad enough trying to sing when you don't know the tune. It's far worse when you're trying to squeeze words in. So we'll just leave it with that one. What kind of love is this that gave itself for me? to stand this time and sing our opening hymn, Would You Be Free From Your Burden of Sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. So after the introduction, let's stand and sing together. Oh 
Amen. That's good singing. Let's just bow together in prayer and let's ask for God's help and for God's blessing to be upon each one of us as we come here tonight. And those listening in live on Facebook as they join us, let's just pray for God's help and his blessing upon us. Our God and our Father, We thank you so much for the privilege that is afforded to us again tonight to come and to meet in this building and to sing the praise of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this lovely day. We praise you for the fellowship we have shared together already this morning. We thank you, Father, for providing everything that we have needed temporarily today And we thank you for putting within our hearts this desire to come tonight just to meet together for our meeting and to again rejoice in the goodness and in the grace and mercy of God and to come with hearts that are filled with gratitude to praise your great name that there is power in the blood of the Lamb. Father, we thank you that you ever sent your Son the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to be our Savior. Father, we thank you that he willingly came and voluntarily laid down his life on that old rugged cross. Father, your word reminds us that he suffered and bled and died in place of guilty sinners just like us. He paid a debt that we could never pay. He died our death. He bore away our sin in his own body on that tree. And many of us tonight know and we love the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're so grateful for Calvary and all that was accomplished there on that old rugged cross. Father, it is our desire that as the Word of God is preached tonight, not just in this place, but in many other places across our province and right across the world in which we live, we ask our Father that it might Please you to bless your servants, to bless every effort that is made to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in the preaching of your word. Father, we pray for ourselves here in this building. Pray, Father, that you might challenge each one of our hearts and bless us afresh. We pray for everywhere else where the word of God will be preached and we ask that God would bless the word of God as it goes forth in many parts of our province tonight, and also in the town in which we live. We thank our Father of special efforts that are going place. We think of the commencement of the mission tonight with John Weir and Mayo Bridge, and we ask that not only tonight, but in nights to come, that you will bless your servant and you will bless the preaching of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the many by teams and camps that are taking place and have already taken place this summer. We thank you, Father, for hearing of those who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we pray, our Father, that many others might come in simple faith, repenting of their sin and trusting Jesus Christ for salvation. Remember those who have gone out from our church here to Poland. We commend them to you tonight, the team, and we pray for each one of them that God will bless them, bring them safely home again tomorrow. For the team that has followed them out, we pray, Lord, for them in the week to come, that you'll bless every effort that is made amongst children and young people. Father, we're very conscious of those who are not able to meet with us tonight for various reasons. We commend to you those who are on holidays, and we pray that you would bless them, keep them safe as they travel, Refresh them and bring them back to us again. For the elderly members and friends of our church family, 
We want them to know that we're thinking about them, that we're praying for them. So, Father, would you bless each one of them? We thank you for them. We thank you for their prayers. And we just ask that God would be near and dear to them in these, the latter years of their lives. So, Father, would you bless each one of us as we come together tonight. Thank you for this lovely day. Thank you for the week that has passed. Thank you for the lovely weather that we've enjoyed and for all the blessings of God upon us. We'd never want to take these things for granted. So, Father, we thank you from the depth of our redeemed hearts that your mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. Hear our prayers. Continue with us. Bless us tonight, we ask, in the Savior's precious and worthy name. Amen. Amen. Now, it's good tonight to welcome you as you join with us here in Banbridge Baptist Church, whether in the building, some listening in tonight live on Facebook, and we thank you for joining with us as well, and we trust that God will bless us as we spend this time together. Now, I said to you this morning, it's been a very warm week, very warm today. If you come out tonight, I'll have you out in good time, and I'll try my best to do that. And let's pray that God, by his Spirit, will move across our land as we have been praying, and then he will come under the sound of the gospel. Good to welcome tonight Pastor Jonathan Burke and his family. That's them along that row there. You'll see them. And it's lovely, Jonathan, and it's lovely to have you all as a family with us tonight. Now, just a few announcements for the incoming week. Wednesday night, 8 o'clock through to 9, will be our summer prayer meeting, so do remember that. Now, on Friday, there will be no Bible study. That's Woody's Bible study. There will be no study this Friday. That takes us through to next Lord's Day. That's 10.45 in the uh, morning prayer meeting, and then 11.30 is the morning meeting and the breaking of bread, and Beverly will be speaking to the children. Johnny and Jenny Finney, Claire Baird, will be in Christ duty next week. Then at a quarter to six, our prayer meeting, which precedes the gospel meeting, at half past six, and God willing, I will be preaching at both services next week. Don't forget the rota for the children's talks from September to December out on the table in the porch. If you're involved in this ministry, please do make sure that you take a copy of that. If those dates it says on it are not suitable, please do make sure that you change with someone else. Missionary Conference, don't forget that that commences Sunday the 4th of September through to Thursday the 8th of September. And again, we're grateful for Alicia producing this for us and for Mervyn for getting them all run off for today. So please take one or two with you. Plan to come yourself. Pray for the missionaries who are coming, and do encourage friends that you know that may be well interested in missions work. Invite them along to join with us. We had a visit from Wesley and Isabel Brewer recently from Faith Mission. They serve with the Faith Mission there in Cumbria, They have sent uh, a number of prayer letters over. If you'd like one, there's still a number out there on the table in the foyer. So please do take one of those and pray for this young couple in a very, very needy area. These are all the announcements. They're made subject, as always, to the sovereign will of God. Now, turn with me as we read God's Word together tonight. And we're going to be thinking about another question that will be a challenge and an encouragement to our hearts tonight. And we're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. And we're going to commence our reading at verse 9. Keep your Bible open. We'll read through to verse 17. And then we'll commence our reading again at verse 24 in that same chapter. So 2 Samuel 18 and verse 9. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it and told Joab, And said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, 
And why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. The man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Attiah, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have brought falsehood against mine own life. For there is no matter hid from the king, and that thou shouldst or wouldst have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel for Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood and laid a very great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled, every one to his tent. Come down with me to verse 24 of the same chapter. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate onto the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, if he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called unto the porter and said, behold, another man running alone. And the king said, he also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, me thinketh, the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day, of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as that young man is. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, O oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Amen. God will add a blessing to this reading of his word. Let's just bow for a moment quietly and ask for God's help. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Your word is precious to us. Your word is a lamp onto our feet and a light onto our path. We thank you, Father, that through your word we can hear the voice of God speaking to our hearts. And we still those hearts tonight as we come just now to think about what God the Lord might say to us. Father, please help us. All of us listening in on Facebook Live, those of us sitting in the building tonight, we just pray that God would open up his word to us and we would learn things that would help us as we journey through life and as we each one live in the light of eternity. Grant us your help, we pray, and we ask it all in the sea of your precious name. Amen. Amen. 
It's been a few weeks since we last looked at our series called Questions About Life that we need to consider. You may remember that we had been thinking about some very important words and a very important question in the book of James chapter 4 where we read these words. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Life at times is difficult for all of us to understand. When it runs smoothly, everything is great. When it's difficult and discouraging, sometimes we wonder about life and why we have to come through some of the things that we do. But you know, I reminded you of three things that you and I need to keep in mind as we travel through this world. That's, this world is not our home. Every one of us are going through this world out into the great eternity and we need to be very clear in our own minds what it is that God expects from us. Three things I reminded you of went like this. Firstly, we need to remember the uncertainty of your life. James painted a picture of a man who was a tradesman, a businessman. He thought he would go away for a year or so and he would trade and make his money and then he would come back home again. And James said, look, hold on for a moment. None of us know what a day will bring forth, let alone a year. You and I can make plans for tomorrow, for this week, for this month, for next year. But the reality is that none of us know if those plans will ever be fulfilled. Life is full of uncertainties. And since you and I don't know what a day will bring forth into our lives, it is so important that we treat life seriously. And that we realize the only time that we have is the time that God has given to us right now. One of these days will be our last day in this world in which we live. And we need to think about that. Secondly, we need to remember the brevity of life. James says, whereas ye know not what shall be in the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, then it vanishes away. In the light of eternity, every single one of us, our lives down here are fleeting and passing. In the light of eternity, our life is so short, and for some shorter than they ever imagined. Do you ever notice that when somebody young dies, you'll hear people turn around and say, do you know they were taken too young or too early? The reality is that any one of us could be taken at any time. We just do not know. We're here today, gone tomorrow. We could be well tonight. We could be dead tomorrow. The only thing that matters as we journey through this life is that we prepare to meet God. Here's the third thing. Remember the end of your life. If my life and yours is uncertain, and one day it is going to come to an end, have you ever thought about where you'll be when life will be no more? You see, there are people in our world that they, they live as if life is going to go on forever and ever. They get the best out of life, but they never give one thought to the whole matter of eternity. But you and I should. Since we last had this message two weeks ago, every one of us are nearer death tonight than we were at that time. And because of that, you and I need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we need to be absolutely sure that when it comes to eternity, that we are a saved people. But what about tonight? I want to turn your thoughts to these verses we have read together in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And I want to introduce you to a young man called Absalom. There's no doubt that within a family unit that there are special ties. You look at any family circle, and I'm sure you'll discover that it has been said often that blood is thicker than water. The family unit is a very, very interesting thing. I know from experience, and you will know the same, that parents will stand up by their children no matter what. 
They might not always agree with what their children do, but they love them, and they'll seek to help them, and they'll try to guide them through the circumstances that they often have to face in life. That's what families do. That's what parents do. Brothers and sisters, although at times they might disagree, will always stand up for each other when it's necessary to do so. So there's something very special and there's something very intimate about the family unit. But tonight in our reading, we see a family that is not only in distress, it's divided, and there is conflict within this family. And we're given the opportunity tonight to look at a relationship between a father and a son. And we're going to consider the solemn question that the father asked his son, or asked about his son, when he said this, is the young man Absalom safe? Is the young man Absalom safe? Let me tell you three things very quickly about Absalom. First of all, think about the character of this young man. Time only permits us to note a few things about this young man's character, but what we know about him makes for very, very interesting reading. Firstly, there's his family background. Absalom was the son of King David. We know sadly that David had taken many wives, and according to 2 Samuel 3, 3, one of David's wives was called Maka. She was the daughter of a man called Talmai. She was from a heathen background, and it would appear that from what we know about Absalom, that he bore all the marks of this heathen people. Now, he was a young man of great beauty, but his life was filled with deceit. He was a young man who was deeply loved by his father, but family love and loyalty meant absolutely nothing to him because we discover he sets out to destroy his father and he sets out to destroy not just his father, but to take his throne. So this young man, Absalom, from heathen stock, was an ungodly soul who not only rebelled against his father, he sought to lead the people of Israel astray. His family background. There is his family betrayal. As a result of David having a number of wives, Absalom had a number of brothers and sisters, and there's one experience, we could choose many, but there's one experience in the life of Absalom that would show us tonight just what kind of character he was. He had a sister named Tamar, a beautiful woman. She had been treated badly her brother, by her brother Amnon. And as a result of that, Absalom was filled with anger. He had a deep hatred for his brother Amnon, and he waited patiently for the time when he would be able to deal with this man, and that time soon came. Absalom arranged a feast, invited all his brothers and sisters along, and with David's permission, he left with Amnon. They thought they were going to be reconciled. David thought they were going to be reconciled but instead Absalom took Amnon's life. You see, on the outside, Absalom was very attractive. He appealed to the people. His father loved him. But inwardly, he was a deceitful character whose life was filled with bitterness and hatred. Do you know, that's one of the fundamental things about us that we all need to remember. No matter what you and I appear to be on the outside, it's what's on the inside that really matters to God. You see, no matter what others see in us and what others know about us, the thing that matters is how God sees us and how God deals with us. See, as far as the Word of God is concerned, it reminds every single one of us tonight, young and old alike, our hearts are deceitful above all things, and they are desperately wicked. You can understand that because the Bible says that we're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. No matter what we seek to do, about that sin, we can do nothing of ourselves to bring about change. We all have a sin problem. 
that needs to be dealt with. And I've reminded you often that sin affects every area of our lives. And I mean every area because we have all been affected by the fall and we are sinners who are ruined and undone. There's no good thing in any one of us. And there's nothing good to be said about us. Sin separates us from God. Don't we understand that God is high and holy? He has no imperfections whatsoever. We know according to the children's hymn that not that the fileth shall ever enter heaven, which is God's abode. And if that's the case, then we as sinners need to have our sins forgiven. We need to have those sins cleansed and washed away in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're different from God. We cannot have fellowship with him the way we are. God lives in a place where there is no sin. And you and I live in a place where sin is abounding. And something within us needs to change. Sin controls the way we live. Don't need to be taught how to sin. It comes naturally to us. We have a fallen nature, a natural bias towards sin. An artist on one occasion was commissioned by his local council to do a painting of the most innocent person that he could find. He took his time and he walked through the streets where he lived and he looked at the men, he looked at the woman, and one day by chance he was passing down a side street and he saw a little boy with blue eyes playing outside his house. This young boy had long curly hair and he looked so innocent. And the artist went over and he sat him down and he took his picture. And very soon a portrait of this young boy was hanging up in the gallery, 20 years later, the same artist was asked to do another painting. But this time it was to be a painting of the most degrading human being that he could find. He did the same thing. He went out and he went through the town and up and down the streets. And then one day as he was passing through an alleyway, he saw a young man lying up against the wall, his hair hanging about his face. He was dirty and he was drunk. And the artist stopped and he took his picture. Very soon the painting was hanging beside the picture of the first little boy. And two words were written above both paintings. One said innocence and the other one said degradation. The artist noticed that as he was holding an exhibition every day, this lady would come and she would stop every day for two weeks. And she stood and she looked at both of those paintings. And she stood for a long time. And one day the artist, being curious, he went over. He approached the woman and he said to her, Tell me, dear, why are you, controlling, are you crying uncontrollably? The woman took a moment. Then she said to him, Sir, do you see those two paintings? Those two paintings are of the same boy. And he's my boy. And I'm crying because that is what sin has done to him. You see, folks, we live in a society where sin is abounding and people think, Live as you like. Doesn't matter about your sin. No consequences. I'll tell you this, and I've said it before. Sin will take anyone further away from God than they ever intended to go. And sin will wreck, and it will ruin, and it will ravish the lives of people today, and in particular, young people. Out in a world that offers so much, and yet, in reality, gives so little. Sir, that is my boy. And I'm crying because what sin has done to him. What a tragedy. But you know what? 
For every sinner, there's a great Savior. For every man and woman and boy and girl who was lost tonight, there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. And that path will lead you directly to the foot of an old rugged cross where Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for sinners just like us. A pastor, that seems so simplistic. It might be. But I'll tell you this, there's no other way that a sinner can be saved. There's no other way that a sinner can come. He must come in repentance and in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ who is the only Savior for sinners like us. He must put his faith and his trust and his hope in Jesus for it's the way of the cross that leads home. We see the character of this young man. Let me remind you of the conduct of this young man. After Ammon's death, things got worse and worse for Absalom. Had to flee from his home, no longer welcome in his father's presence. Left his father's court. For three years his father mourned the fact Absalom was gone. Rearranged the circumstances so that he could return again. But even then his father refused to see his face. And behind his back, Absalom was furthering his own ends. Began to win over the hearts of the people. Turned the hearts of the people away from his father. And they began to follow him instead. By the time David recognized what was happening, it was too late. Absalom had won the people and their hearts. He stole his father's throne. David went into a state of exile. And despite the love and affection David had shown, it meant nothing to Absalom. And he rebelled against his father's love. I wonder tonight, have you done that? Whether you're young or old, you might turn around and say, well, surely, Pastor, it's only young people who can rebel against their father's love. Not at all. I met a man on one occasion I was asked to go and see. He was in his 80s. And I was asked to go to see him because he wasn't saved. And we sat in his room. And he said to me, I know why you've come. Well, I said, I'm glad about that. He says, you want to talk to me about getting saved? I says, I do. Your family's concerned. He says to me, Pastor, I want to tell you something. Now, this man was in his 80s. He says, my mother and father were some of the best Christians that ever lived. And I can tell you they lived a life that challenged me. And I know I need to be saved, but... And I said, but what? Ah, he says, it's too late for me. Never too late, of course, if you're in your 80s, 90s, or even older than that. But it's too late when you rebel against God. It's too late when you've no time for the gospel. It's too late when you make a conscious decision of Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross that I will not have this man to rule over me. Maybe a young person as you sit here tonight, you're saying to yourself, you know what, Pastor Taylor, you're just talking about me. Why? You too cradled in the gospel. Resent the faith that your parents stand for. You've been prayed for and loved and brought up in the things of God. And yet, you've decided that spiritual things are not for you. Do you want me to tell you tonight why parents love you and speak to you about your sin and your soul because they love you. They only want what's best for you. They long that when it comes to the end of your journey too, that when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. You'll be there. Can you imagine a man in his 80s who has since 
slipped out into eternity, and I buried him. Can you imagine that man going out into a lost eternity and knowing for umpteen years of the claims of Jesus Christ? Young people, you have an opportunity while you're long, young to seek the Lord Jesus Christ while he might be found. It's not enough to grow up in a Christian home knowing about Christ, hearing gospel stories, knowing about the cross and the one who died for your sins. You need to come to Christ yourself. You need to turn away from your sin and put your trust in him. Don't we read in the scriptures of a young man who couldn't wait to get away from home get away from under the father's control. He was loved. And it must have broken his father's heart when this young man walked down the road away from his home with his inheritance to a land that seemed bright and fair. Enjoyed himself to the full. Parties, friends, all things that money could buy. And when the money was done, the friends moved on and his life was in a mess. We call him the prodigal son. Thy God, he came to an end of himself, realized he had sinned against God, came home to a father who had never stopped loving him. Be careful tonight with the decisions that you make, about the way that you take, because that road could lead you to ruin and to despair. Do you know what? Many a young man or woman has broken a father's heart. And in the process, lost their own soul. The character of this young man, the conduct of this young man. What about the conclusion to this young man? Absalom may have driven his father, David, into a state of exile, but for him it wasn't over. He'd rebelled. But the only way that he could get what he wanted was to steal his father's throne, but little did he know. His life would end both drastically and dramatically. Why do I say that? Will you read the story? We've done it tonight. And you'll see his sudden end. He carried out all his plans effectively, won over the hearts of the people, thought he was going to be successful, and then there was a battle. David wasn't involved in it. He told his army not to deal harshly with Absalom, his son. And despite everything Absalom had done, David still loved him. But it was not to be. In the midst of the battle, 2 Samuel 18, 9, and Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak. And his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away. And Joab finished the job, and I say that very reverently. He almost had the kingdom in his grasp. And he lost the battle. And he lost his life. He lost his own soul. Death cropped up unexpectedly and snatched him away. That's the way it is with death. Think of the number of times throughout your lifetime when somebody you've met or a phone call to your home has turned around and told you about someone that you knew who was just taken away unexpectedly. That's how it is with death. And that's why it's so important to be ready when it comes. His sudden end, his sad experience. Absalom died the way that he had lived in Oregon deceitful, rebellious young man. And when the news came to David that the battle was over, he asked the same question twice. Is the young man Absalom 
See, David wasn't concerned about who won the battle. In this situation, there were no victors. This was his son. David wasn't worried about the spoils of war. He was only concerned about the rebellious son that he loved. And he said, is the young man, Absalom, saved? He wasn't saved. He had died. And he had died the way he lived. And he was lost. His sudden end, his sad experience, his sobbing father. To Samuel eighteen thirty three. The king was much moved, went up to the chamber over the gate, and he wept, and as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. But to God I had died for thee. O Absalom, my son, my son. When David realized his son was dead and his soul was lost, it broke his heart. His son had died and he felt it. His son was lost and he knew it. Would to God, David says, that I had died in your place. He had asked the question, is the young man Absalom safe? But he wasn't safe. And David knew it. And that's why David says, would to God, I had died in your place. Man or woman, she faced death and as eternity stares you in the face tonight, is it safe with you? Or to put it another way that you'll understand, is it well with your soul? You say, Pastor, I'm not sure. Well, if you're not sure, you wait tonight and you talk with me. Lest the next phone call that comes to a friend is to tell them about the sudden, unexpected death that you've come through. If you're not sure, be absolutely sure. Young person, as you journey through life, are your loving parents heartbroken because they're saved and you're not? And they dread one day standing at a graveside because you're lost and they know it and they're turning around within and their hearts are broken and bleeding and they're saying, Would to God, I had died in your place. I suppose the question is simple, isn't it? What about your soul? That's it. When all said and done, young or old, what about your soul? A young man who was the son of a minister rebelled against his godly upbringing and as soon as he was old enough, he left home and he joined the army. He had a very, very good military career, very successful but for the next 10 years, it led him into a life that was steeped in sin. Such was the sin, and such was the shame of his life. One day, he couldn't take it anymore, and he took his own life. When the young man's body was found, there was a note beside it, and it said this, This has nothing to do with my fellow officers. I ask them to forgive me for disgracing this great regiment. God alone knows the life that I've lived for these past 10 years and how I loathe myself and my sin. 
My honor is gone. So too all the other precious gifts that I have lost that will never return. I'm now in a fathomless hell without a ray of hope. Friend, that's no way to live. And that's certainly no way to die. Is the young man Absalom safe? No. He wasn't safe. He died. The way he lived. He was lost. And David knew it. And he cried from a broken heart word to God. I had died in your place. Make sure you learn lessons from Absalom's life. Make sure you're safe in the arms of Jesus and make sure that all is well with your soul. Let's sing this lovely hymn in closing. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea Bellows roll. Let's sing this and then we'll close in prayer. Father, may we 
each one know this of a truth. May we be sure tonight in our own souls that all is well. When life is no more and death has come and eternity is our portion, that each one of us, young and old alike, can say it is well. It is well with my soul. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the Lord's day. We look forward to it and we rejoice in it. And as we part tonight, having listened to your word afresh, take us to our homes in safety. Watch over us throughout this week. And in all things, help us to live for your glory. Separate us with your blessing, we ask, in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen.